Thanks so much for being here today. I'll wait till we get settled. Okay. So, thank you all so much for being here today to talk about the North Star Act. In the days after Donald Trump was elected in 2016, I and my fellow immigration attorneys reached out to one another to let them know that if their clients showed up at our doors, we would let them in, no questions asked. We could not have imagined the next four years would bring as the Trump administration tore apart families and communities and literally terrorized immigrants at, within and at our borders. The echoes of history cannot be ignored. My family on both sides came to the United States at the turn of the 20th century fleeing persecution against Jews in Eastern Europe. I grew up in a community that had been directly touched by the Holocaust. At Hebrew school, we were steeped in literature and poetry, describing the ways in which regular people stood by and did nothing as their friends and neighbors were slowly isolated and rounded up. North Star Act is both about our values as Minnesotans and is also a highly technical bill designed to create clarity and to ensure that we invest state and local resources toward the betterment of Minnesotans, rather than wasting them enforcing our broken federal immigration laws. The North Star Act says that Minnesota does not terrorize its residents. Minnesota does not waste precious public dollars enforcing broken federal immigration laws. Minnesota is a place where immigrants will have opportunity to contribute to our communities, to our economy, and to their families. In terms of the technical aspects of the bill, it prohibits collaboration and data sharing between state and local government entities and the federal government for the sole purpose of civil immigration enforcement. It explicitly permits other types of collaboration for purposes of public safety and where federal law requires it. I am supporting this bill because I have spent my entire, entire adult life working in the field of immigration law, first as a paralegal and later as an immigration attorney. Through my work, I have seen what the data shows that immigrants make the American dream. My clients have been curing Alzheimer's disease, building our homes from laying the carpet to designing the architecture. They've enriched our art scene and they have taught our children in our schools. They are doctors and nurses and PCAs and they are caring for our parents and our grandparents in their final years. This bill is common sense, and this bill is urgent to ensure that our resources are not co-opted by the federal government to enforce laws in a way that is harmful to immigrant communities. It has been a true pleasure working with the advocates and the community um, to draft this legislation that will save us money and create important clarity in the law. The federal government can and will continue to enforce federal immigration laws in Minnesota. This bill simply ensures that it is not the responsibility of the state of Minnesota to perform that role. Um, and I would also like to just make sure everyone understands that there is a new version of this bill that we will be introducing um, that has already been introduced in the pre-session process. Um, so the version of the bill that was introduced last year is an old version. And so I urge you all to stay tuned for the new version of the bill that we have just introduced. Um, and with that, I am honored to introduce Jesus Garcia Garcia, who is right over here. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesus Garcia Garcia, and I'm honored to share my perspective both as a DACA beneficiary and as a researcher in Minnesota. As someone who has been in the United States since 2003 and a DACA recipient since two 2012, the fear of deportation has been a constant shadow in my life. It's impacted every decision I've made from where I live to the opportunities I pursue. But despite these challenges, I've, dis I've dedicated myself to my studies and to contributing positively to my community. As a PhD student researcher uh, cancer, uh, studying cancer school-based tumors and a DevOps Linux engineer at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, working on high profiles cases like Loris and other projects where human brain development is studied by many top institutions. My work is not a, it's just a job, it's a passion. My research, funded by NIH grants, is pushing the boundaries of what's possible in understanding and treating these diseases. But the uncertainty of my immigration status has always been a cloud over my accomplishments. The North Star Act is more than just a piece of legislation, le legislation to me, it's a lifeline. 
a recognition that immigration enforcement is a federal responsibility, not something that should be left to the state and local authorities. This bill will mean that I and others like myself could focus on our work and our studies without constant fear of deportation hanging over our heads. On a personal level, this legislation would give me the peace of mind to fully engage in my community and pursue my dreams without reservation. It would mean being able to fully embrace all Minnesota has to offer without the fear that one misstep could append everything I've worked for so far. But it's not just about me. The North Star Act would have far-reaching benefits for our entire state by fostering trust between immigrant communities and the law enforcement. It will make all Minnesotans safer, and by allowing Im immigrants, communities, and the law enforcement, it will make all of Minnesota safer. And by allowing immigrants like myself and fully, to fully participate in our economy and society, it will strengthen the state for generations to come. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions about this. Thank you. Thank you. We have John Bender from ICOM who's going to share a few words. Good morning. My name is John Benda. I'm on the board of directors of the Interfaith Coalition on Immigration, or ICOM. ICOM is a group of people of many faiths and no particular faith that take action to support our newest Minnesotans and to oppose systems like immigration detention that dehumanize and destabilize families. We, lock, we walk alongside families in crisis, we hold vigils at detention centers, and we are proud to be one of the founding organizations in this campaign to pass statewide legislation, separating state law enforcement from federal immigration enforcement because we have seen firsthand through the clients in our aid program how intermingling those systems puts families and communities into unnecessary crisis that saps state resources and makes us all less safe. In one case we were involved in in 2019, a father who committed a traffic violation was detained by ICE and ultimately deported, despite having been a pillar of the Mexican community in the Mankato area for over 20 years. This caused cascading crises for his children whose college trajectories were put at risk, his wife who was awaiting a visa that was later granted, his employer who testified about how vital this man was for his small business and his entire community where this man taught Mexican culture in local schools and served as an advisor for newly arrived families from Latin America. In essence, this man ended up serving a life sentence for a traffic violation that would simply have warranted a ticket if he were a citizen. Our state lost a vital community member and a resource and those immigrant communities lost trust that they could turn to law enforcement were they ever to be victims of of or witnesses to crime and that would truly threaten public safety. We know that this act has been called a sanctuary state bill and as our members are primarily people of faith, that is a concept that resonates with our values. However, our experience in working alongside immigrants and refugees is that while sanctuary is needed in a crisis, it is not actually what our cl clients and newly arrived members, neighbors want. They don't want to be hidden away in a church basement and protected, they actually want what all of us want, the safety, trust, and respect to contribute to the building to the building of communities and businesses in Minnesota so that they, their families, and all of us can thrive together. That's why we are proud to be standing alongside dozens of other faith communities, immigrant-led organizations, and human rights defenders in calling for the passage of the North Star Act in 2024. Thank you. And I am to introduce Andrea, Andrea Bauer, an educator from Birdsville. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrea Bauer, and I work for Burnsville Independent uh, ISD 191, and we straddle Dakota County and Scott County. And I, my role is a cultural liaison, so a lot of student support, social work, a lot of the role of the counselors. Uh, our district has had, uh, like many, an unprecedented number of new in the country students over the last few years. I personally do the intake with students and their families for hundreds 
every single year. Uh, and that involves helping them feel safe, understand their rights both within the school and in the community. That story is very different, sometimes even county to county, municipality to municipality, and that is why one big part of why the North Star Act is so important. Um, I was going to bypass a specific anecdote, but on my way here, I was actually helping a colleague through an issue where a, f a, a mother was seeking support for a pretty severe domestic abuse situation, and she had been letting it go on and on, letting it, that's not the right words, uh, because she was afraid of immigration, consequences with immigration. And it is our role in the school district to support that because that student cannot show up to learn. That's one anecdote. We have hundreds, thousands of them just in our district alone. So that is the kind of impact that the North Star Act can have. And I am very grateful for this being pushed through, hopefully, this legislative session. I'd like to introduce uh, Senator Fate. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Omar Fateh. I'm the Minnesota State Senator representing uh, Southside Minneapolis. Uh, last year, the DFL trifecta passed the historic and monumental legislation that benefited all Minnesotans, including our undocumented immigrant community. Uh, legislation like the driver's licenses for all, which benefited public safety and kept our roads, roads safe. Uh, the Minnesota Care Expansion, taking care of their health and well-being and the North Star Promise, which provides tuition-free college for all working-class Minnesotans, including our undocumented immigrants. Amen. Minnesota has a long history of welcoming new Americans to our communities, and our state is better off because of it. Today, non-citizen residents operate cherished local businesses, contribute to every step of our food system, from harvesting crops to processing meat, cooking in restaurants to delivering meals. They care for our, they care for our children, the sick and elderly, and they build houses and hospitals. The more than 40 House and Senate co-authors of this bill come from a diverse patchwork of communities and share one thing in common. They want the people of Minnesota to be safe and to feel safe. This year's presidential election makes many Americans afraid of what might happen to their families and their loved ones. In these uncertain times, bold and decisive action to protect our immigrant communities is necessary. We know that citizen and non-citizen residents live side by side, often within the same household. We should not waste resources chasing them down around at the demand of Donald Trump, and no Minnesotan should have to think twice about calling 911 because their car was stolen or their child has a medical emergency. Almost everyone in this room is here because one day, either in the recent or distant past, a person or a family made a decision to go on a long journey and to start a new life. Against the odds, they made it here. You made it here. Let's celebrate, that to come, let's celebrate that choice to come to America and remind them why, of all the places in the world to start a new life, they chose Minnesota. Thank you. And now, and now I'm here and honored to represent uh, Guadalupe Lopez, the Executive Director of Violence Free Minnesota. Bonjour and hola. Um, my name is Guadalupe Lopez. I'm the executive director of Violence Free Minnesota. I'm also first generation born from Michoacan, Mexico, and I'm Anishinaabe, which is uh, many, many generations back. Um, I'm I come here to stand in solidarity with everyone today, um, coming from the Violence Free Minnesota Coalition to end um, abuse. Um, we find and we recognize that um, to end violence on behalf of the citizens, legal, permanent residents, and visa holders on behalf of our entire community and on our doc undocumented relatives, and how important that safety is. We are here today because every time we ask, we hear stories about victims and survivors of domestic violence who decline to reach out for resources and, uh, and law enforcement. Um, and we hear that they're too afraid to be put into the system and what will happen, even if they are uh, documented. 
we do uh, not want to draw attention to their, they do not want to draw attention to their entire family or their friends or even their abusers. We are here today because our undocumented neighbors make up a beloved part of our community. We are here today because I was, it was not so long ago that people in relationships and primarily women were told to put up with a manner of toxic and harmful behavior with no resources because that was just how things were. We are here today because many of our communities still feel that they are without resources to harmful behavior and the institutions built to maintain community safety have not earned their trust, had not earned our trust and we have caused great they have caused great trauma and harm. We are here today because that exact problem of lack of trust is so much more pronounced in undocumented communities. We are here today because the crucial moment of crisis of violence occurs every, 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 every day and everyone should feel safe to pick up the phone and to call help for resources, both within systems and community agency programs. We trust that we will, um, they will be, with trust that they will be assisted and that they're um, and not punished or further harmed when they do reach out for help. We are here today because we care and because undocumented victim survivors care and that we are here because all of us deserve a violence-free Minnesota. Thank you for everybody for the hard work that you've done and I am proud to stand in solidarity with you. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Hornstein. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. And like others who have spoken, uh, this issue is very personal to me. I'm also first generation. Um, my parents were refugees. They survived the Nazi Holocaust and came and built a new life in this country. And that is why anything involving an issue like this is so passionate and so heartfelt for me. And the North Star Act, as uh, Senator Fateh says, will build on our incredible success from last session. We need to continue the momentum that we have built. And so as I reflected on this day and this press conference, I thought of 2003. And the very first uh, time I gave a speech on the House floor it was weeks into the session. I, I, I was uh, a little uh, shy as a new uh, freshman at that point. But I did speak up because the very first House file, House file one that year, was after 9-11 a time of increasing xenophobia and Islamophobia in this country. And so the bill was to have the visa uh, ex expiration date on people's license plates, a very, very anti-immigrant uh, proposal in the wake of 9-11. And so what I said then and what I said now was simple from the book of Exodus. I reminded the body that what it says is, you must not mistreat or oppress foreigners in any way. Remember, yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. And that is the reminder why we must support this bill and we must support initiatives to make everybody feel welcome and safe in the state of Minnesota. And so now at this point, we will be happy to uh, answer your questions. Uh, please direct them to any, any of the speakers uh, who've spoken. Uh, so far today. This question is for Sandra. Uh, those who I spoke with who oppose the bill say that the language is too broad, more specifically referring to the term government agent. Um, and what does that mean? Is that any nonprofit organization who receives government funding who is now able to enforce this sort of uh, practice? Thank you so much for the question. So to confirm, as I said at the beginning of this press event, the version of the bill that we introduced last session is very different than the version of the bill that we are introducing this session. Um, we have spent the entire interim working really closely with legal experts, with law enforcement stakeholders, with state agencies, and with communities who will be impacted to ensure that the bill that we draft is very um, technically sophisticated and will achieve its goals and not have unintended consequences. And so the bill does refer to uh, 
um, state and local government units. And so that's going to include um, obviously state agencies, schools, um, cities and counties, municipalities. Um, it, sh it would not include anybody who's ever received state funding of some sort. And would it be correct in, in understanding this is a new bill, not amendments to the old one? Absolutely, and I think that's really important because there's been some analysis of a bill that is not this bill. Thanks. And, and the, the language should be published imminently um, on Monday at the very latest. And how many sponsors do you have now? We have the most you can possibly have. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah. A lot of our colleagues who are here to support this bill are co-authors, and we are eternally grateful. We have 35 co-authors in the House. Um, too many to individually name, but if Senator Fate wants yeah. to talk about the Senate. So immediately, we got a lot of enthusiasm around the bill. Uh, currently, we have three co-authors, but we had a, about 10 that wanted to, the first five slots. So we're letting them fight it out right now. So <laughs> let, let, them, let them handle it. <laughs> what will be the first committees to hear this bill? In the House, it will be the State and Government um, Finance Committee, State and Local Government Finance Committee, and I believe in the Senate is yep, same. Oh, oh, same? First, okay. uh, yeah, it's going to go through uh, Judiciary um, Committee as well as State and Local Government Committee. Mm -hmm. And eventually Senator, it'll go, Public Safety and Judiciary are separate in the House, so it'll go to both of those. Yes. Do you believe you have the votes among DFL caucus members in the Senate? Well, so far I've received a lot of enthusiastic feedback right now. We're still having ongoing conversations with our caucus, but uh, I'm very confident that we can get this across the finish line. And we'll keep working with everyone you know, to make it happen. Could you provide a kind of a scenario of what an interaction between a law enforcement officer and a, an immigrant without uh, full status, what, what that currently how that currently goes down compared to how it would go down if this bill becomes law? Well, I think one of the things that's really important is that by passing this law, we would build trust so that there would be hopefully more interactions between people who are afraid for their safety or who witness a crime, um, who are the victim of a crime. Um, they would be able to reach out to law enforcement. Um, they wouldn't have any fear of reaching out, you know, for health care support um, to their schools for for both personal and educational supports. Um, so, so right now, um, ICE could ask for information from schools about students and their families. And once this law passes, they will not be able to do so. And this is both important for how it would work and also how people will feel in terms of trusting in their institutions. How would this bill impact people who are currently incarcerated in Minnesota and have ICE detainers right now? I think I'm going to phone a friend who is a lawyer. <laughs> I mean, I'm a lawyer too, but we have like a couple like super lawyers. Um, Anna or Virgil, do you want to take this? So it's oh, wait, you have to come over to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Virgil Wiebe. I'm at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. For someone who is currently in um, criminal custody, um, it's clear from the case law in Minnesota, uh, federal case law, that detainers are not uh, legal unless they're issued by a judge. And in most cases, those detainers aren't um, aren't authorized by a judge. So those detainers really don't have a controlling authority on local officials. So would they, this law, would they still <coughs> exist on paper, or would they be lifted under this bill? Uh, well, detainers are, are issued by ICE. Mm -hmm. This bill cannot uh, control ICE. And so ICE could still try to issue those detainers, but they would not be respected. Crime involved is my understanding, right? Yeah. Well, if, if they're, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to some. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question, and I think it's really important to emphasize that this bill does not impact our public safety institutions in doing their job. And in fact, it's going to support their ability to do so because they are not going to be wasting money or time trying to enforce our civil immigration laws. And so any time that there is a criminal investigation or someone is incarcerated because they have committed a crime, this bill would not impact how the public safety systems work. Just to touch on a statement we got from the minority leader in the House this morning, um, Republicans seem concerned that this will turn the state into a magnet for immigration. I mean, is that a concern that 
you guys share? How would you address that argument? <laughs> Um, so, this is a bill about state and local government. It's not about federal immigration laws. Um, and, and so, I would just really emphasize that, that while this bill is, you know, it is a reflection of our values as Minnesotans, it's also a very highly technical, very specific bill that will do a very specific thing. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we did this past session alone, or this past term alone, um, to ensure that immigrants who are here are able to fully contribute to our community. Um, and two things that I think are worth emphasizing are that we created a permanent Office of New Americans. Um, this was one of Governor Walz's priorities. Um, and um, that's within the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And what it does is it ensures that people who are here, who are non-citizens, are going to be able to contribute to our workforce as efficiently as possible. We also created $14 million in funding to ensure that people who are here who are eligible for work authorization under immigration law are able to access that work authorization as efficiently as possible. So I'm really proud of how proactive we've been in ensuring that immigrants who are here are going to be able to truly contribute to their fullest capabilities. Yes. If you want to add anything? That was perfect. Cool. <laughs> you cited an example about ICE going into school. Are there any other examples? I know it's a broad question that you can share that this bill will hopefully eliminate moving forward. Does anyone else besides me want to talk? I can answer uh, this. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. So um, ICE has a power called a 1509 administrative subpoena, and they have abused that power to, across the country, ask for sensitive data from abortion clinics, schools, youth soccer leagues. There's a lot of articles uh, covering a FOIA request that was made of the Department of Homeland Security a couple of years ago. And so to answer your question, that is what this bill is fighting against. I got my cell phone. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Emilio Rodriguez. Uh, I am an organizer with Copal, uh, and I'm excited to be here. I used to work with Senator Fata, and it's really awesome to see the bill progress as the way it has. So thank you very much. Thanks, Emilio. Uh, for the, the, any of the lawmakers up there, any concern, uh, especially in the House, the impact this might have? Uh, at the elections, you're trying to hold on to your majority. Immigration is a huge issue uh, nationally, and it's likely to be in this election as well. Any concern about that? Yeah. Right, let's do that. Yeah. But do you want to? I don't want to be like taking up all the air. Yeah, thank you. Um, there shouldn't be a concern right now. We're still having ongoing conversations about how to better the lives of all Minnesotans, and that's what it's about. We're not here to win elections. We're here to better the lives and do our jobs. And I think this is. <laughs> Also, okay. just say, like, I would emphasize, like, as you can see, we have a lot of energized people who are here from all across Minnesota who are very excited about this bill. Um, we have, uh, I think, t about 20 people who came from St. Cloud this morning just to be here with us today. Um, this is the same legislature and the same governor that passed the Minnesota Care Expansion, that created the Office of New Americans, that created yes. funding for work authorization for immigrants, that um, driver's license for all. How can I forget that? Um, <laughs> same legislature. We are going to run on that record very proudly, and I'm excited to do it. Well, there's a lot of people not in this room who think it's the government's job to enforce the law. Are you concerned about what they're going to do, perhaps, at the polls during the House elections? Yeah, I would love to talk to those people about who enforces which laws, because the state enforces the state laws. It is the federal government's job to enforce federal laws. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, can I add something yeah, to please. that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, last year during driver's licenses, what we heard was that Minnesotans didn't support it. It was a public safety hazard issue, right? And what we saw on the outside, not in the legislature, but on the outside, is that it was a bipartisan issue, that the police supported it, the chamber supported it, and the people supported it. And so this is, I think, a winning issue for Minnesotans because we love our immigrants. Say your name. Uh, I'm Zayda Mohammed, and I represent South Minneapolis in the Minnesota Senate. <laughs> Excuse me if I oh, missed yeah. this before I got here. Is there any data yet on how many um, immigrants have taken advantage of driver's licenses for all? We they say, I don't know. Anyone in the room want to come up and introduce themselves and answer? 
Um, I, I know just anecdotally yeah. that a lot of people have been able to get driver's license so that they are they have identity. They have, oh, hey, we have uh, answers, I, not just Hi, Ryan, Ryan Perez, Copal, Minnesota. Um, what I don't have is data. What I can say uh, anecdotally is that uh, Copal operates one of the DVS partner locations for the written test. And we're dealing with dozens of folks every day coming in to take that written test just at our location on Lake Street, uh, let alone the partners that are doing that work in Mankato, uh, Austin, Rochester, uh, and across the state. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of folks who, uh, you know, we're driving, uh, but we're not in systems to ensure folks' public safety. Uh, may have been driving without insurance or at absurdly high rates. So that law is improving the quality of life of folks who were already driving, who already needed to get their kids to school, and are now in a place of human dignity. So what we're fighting for today is human dignity, and that's the fight that continues at whatever expense. And I would add, I would add very, very briefly, um, in order to protect the people who have just been given their licenses, this bill has to pass because once they get in traffic stops, they might be questioned about their immigration status mm -hmm. by local law enforcement. There is an uh, issue of ICE being used as translators uh, across the border for routine traffic stops. So this is what this bill mm -hmm. needs to protect as well. And, and two points. Um, I would say there is only benefit and no cost to ensuring that our roads are safe for all of us. Um, and yeah, that was the main point. I had another point, but it's gone. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> Any other questions? What was the main reason that you decided to change the bill? What, what was wrong with the old one that you're going to change in this one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so, so we introduced a version of the bill that was very broad. And over the interim, what we did is we had countless meetings, I can't even tell you how many meetings, with law enforcement stakeholders, with government agencies, with communities who will be impacted, with legal experts. Um, and we worked really hard um, to draft a bill that was really deliberately crafted to ensure that we are not um, impacting public safety, collaboration, and communications, to ensure that we are not doing something that would be unconstitutional, because we want to make sure that the federal government can do what it needs to do to enforce its laws. And so the version of the bill um, is a very tightly crafted, um, deliberate bill that takes into account all of the expertise and insights that, that we can possibly get. So it's a really great version of the bill. We're excited for you to see it. You talk about uh, it's going to save money. Mm -hmm. Okay. When people say it's going to save money, how much and where is the money being spent right now? I mean, do you have a data that says, oh, every year or last year in Minnesota, $2 million was spent, da 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 mm -hmm. well, it's, you know, Instead of just throwing something out there that, oh, that sounds wonderful, mm -hmm. do you have facts behind it? Yeah. Well, when we tell our state and local governments that they get to focus on doing the job that they are intending to do, which is our education, our public safety, um, our court systems, and that they don't have to do extra stuff that is taking the resources of their staff, um, then they're going to save money. Um, and I, I will ask um, other colleagues here, um, you know, we are not the first state to take this step, and so I'm not... I'm not aware of the data in other states, but I don't know if anyone is. But we can absolutely um, provide that information, but I think it's very intuitive that if we're asking people to not do a bunch of extra stuff and focus on the things that they actually want to do and are being paid our taxpayer dollars to do, that they're going to save money. Okay, Thanks. so you're guessing. I, I think, you're yep, thank you so much. No, nope, it's logic. You don't have numbers solid to say, here's how much was wasted last year by local officials chasing down people who are illegal immigrants. Feel free to email me and we can provide you some data. I think it's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions before we wrap? Oh, it looks like we're done. I'm sorry, the staff people are like, we're done. Um, but we are all very happy to answer any questions individually. Feel free to reach out to us by email, schedule appointments. Thank you all so much for being here.